Hey everyone, this video is called Multivariable Systems Over Time. It's a pretty fancy sounding name, but all it's really referring to is any question in section one where you're given some kind of system or setup where you're shown how it changes over the course of time, whether it's round by round or minute by minute, any question in section one where you're shown how things change over time. So I'm going to go through a few questions of that nature in this presentation and show you the best approach for, for dealing with them. So just to help orientate you, this is tutorial four. It's one of the four videos I've got in the problem solving subsection of section one. Um, I'm just going to get straight into it with a question. I think the best way to help illustrate what I'm talking about and the best way of dealing with these questions is just to, to begin. So here it is. Take a minute to read it. Uh, you can see that we're dealing with a small town here with three traffic lights. Uh, and each of these three traffic lights has a different amount of time for each color light. So they cycle through green, orange, red, and then back to green. But each traffic light does so in a different period of time. So you can see all the various numbers here for each of the three traffic lights. Uh, and it says at the bottom here that at 1 p.m. all three traffic lights turn green at the same time. And the question we're being asked is when is the next time that this will happen again? So it may sound a bit tricky. Um, and I guess, I mean, this question here illustrates very well what I'm talking about by multivariable systems over time. Uh, the multivariable system bit is that we now have three different traffic lights, so there's several different variables at play. And the over time bit is obviously just the fact that they change over time in different periods of time, from green to orange to red, and, and so forth. So this is a, what I'm talking about by multivariable systems over time. In terms of how to approach it, I think the key is just to break down each system uh, into, well, look at them individually, basically. Look at each system or each period of time individually and just focus on the bit that you're interested in. So in other words, in this question, we've got three different traffic lights. So we wanna look at each one of those individually. And the bit we're interested in is when it turns green because ultimately that's what the question is asking us. So we wanna just work out when each individual traffic light turns green and then look for the common time between all of those. So quite simply, the way I would do this is begin with the main traffic light, which is given at the top, which you can see is green for four minutes and then orange for one and then red for seven. So if it's turning green at 1 p.m., as we've been given here in the final line, then that means that it's turning green at 1 p.m. and then it'll stay that way for four minutes, then go orange for one and then red for seven. So that, that entire sequence there of four minutes, then one, then seven, is a total of 12 minutes. So it's gonna be another 12 minutes before that traffic light turns green again, assuming that it cycles from green to orange to red back to green. So every 12 minutes, it turns green again. So I would just write out something like this, where we've got the main street traffic light, which is the one up the top here. And you can see every 12 minutes is when it, it changes green again. Uh, it's really just a case of doing the same thing for the other two traffic lights. So you can see the second street one goes six minutes, then two, then six. So that's a, a 14 minute cycle in total, six plus two plus six. So I'm gonna do the same thing here with second street and just go 14, 28, 42, 56, 70, 84, so on. So these just represent the, the minutes past 1 p.m. where each traffic light turns green again. Um, same thing for the final one. So third street, you can see it's in periods of six because we've got three plus one plus two. So every six minutes, the third street one will turn green. So that's, that's the important thing, just to understand that what these numbers show is each of the three traffic lights in terms of when they turn green again. So after 12 minutes, after 24, so on, past 1 p.m. Now, given the question is saying, when is the next time that all three will turn green at the same time? We need to find a number down here in the bottom, which is present in all three rows. We need to find a number that's common to all three. Um, to find that, I think it's probably easiest to go through the answers and just pick out the numbers we've got here. Because you know that the answer has to be either 14, 24, 42, or 224, which would be a total of 84 minutes past 1 p.m. So if you look for 14, you can see there's a 14 there, but in none of the other two rows. So it can't be 114. 24 present here in Main Street and in 3rd Street, but unfortunately not in 2nd Street. 42, uh, again, you can see it there a couple of times, but not in all three. But 224, which is 84 minutes after 1 p.m. You can see 84 minutes past 1 p.m. here, and here and here. So in all three rows, you can see uh, 84, which means that 84 minutes after 1 p.m., 
all three lights will turn green. And that's why D would be the correct answer. So that's kind of the basic approach to these questions. Look at each system one by one in terms of what you're interested in, and then just try and come to uh, some answer based on the commonality between them. It may not be the most elegant way of doing it by having to write out all the different numbers, but it's definitely the simplest and it's quite quick. Uh, ultimately, even if you have to write out this kind of thing at the bottom, it's still fairly quick. We'll go to question two now. Um, even though it looks a bit different because we've got these two diagrams in the middle of the page, it's actually very similar to question one. So if you want to have a go at solving this one using the technique we went through before, uh, please go ahead. You can see in this question there are two circular display cases shown below. We've got display case A and B, and they show a range of foods which are listed around both of them. Now, at any given time, only one item is visible, and that item is the one that's in the position where the waffle is currently in cabinet A, and the pie is in cabinet B. You can see that they're, they're in capitals. So that's the position where uh, the, the customers can see the food, and all these other positions, unfortunately, they can't see them. Now, these two cases rotate, and you can see that in this final sentence or two, it says that they rotate clockwise. So in other words, everything will shuffle around this way, so that the pudding will go to where the waffle was, the waffle will go to where the pie was, pie to the cake, and so on. Everything will shuffle around one spot clockwise, and this happens every 10 seconds. And so when that does happen, uh, all of a sudden the waffle will become not visible, and the pudding will shift into where the waffle was, and the pudding at that point will become the visible food. And this happens every 10 seconds, so the whole cabinet shuffles around every 10 seconds in this way. And that's true for both A and for B. That's the basic setup of the question. Uh, take a minute just to make sure that that's clear in your head. Um, you can see that it's actually very similar to question one. Even though it's a different setup, the, the fundamental basis is very similar. Whereas in the previous question we had the three different traffic lights, we now have the two cabinets. And whereas those three traffic lights each had three colours, red, orange and green, that they cycled through, here we've got a variety of foods that we cycle through in the same way. Every few seconds we, we change food in the same way that every few minutes they, the traffic lights change colour. So it's actually very similar. And the question itself is also quite similar. It's asking how many seconds will pass between the start of the situation shown here and the next point in which both display cases are displaying a cake. So you can see it's very similar to how the previous question asked for the next point in time where, both, or where all traffic lights showed green. Um, and again, we've got our, our answers here which guide us as to how long it might be. So it's a, it's a very similar procedure in terms of solving. Um, just begin with cabinet A and then work out the various points in time where a cake will become visible by rotating around into this visible position where the waffle currently is. So in 10 seconds time, cabinet A will shuffle around such that the pudding will become visible. And just keep working from there. So in 10 seconds time, the pudding will be visible. Therefore, in 20 seconds time, the pie will shuffle around. So 20 seconds for the pie, 30 for waffle, 40 for cake. And then you can see that the trick here is that there are two cakes, so you have to keep looking around. So after 40 seconds, a cake will appear here. And again, after 40, 50, 60 seconds, another cake will appear. So because we've got two cakes to deal with, it becomes a bit more complicated than the first question where you just had the same number repeating again and again. So in other words, in the first question we had, for example, you know, 6, then 12, then 18, then 24. Whereas now because we've got two separate items, it won't be that same nice even spacing. Um, but I would just write out again, very similar to before, something like this where we've got after 40 seconds, we'll see this cake. After 60, we'll see that one. And just keep counting around from there. So 60 up for that cake, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 120. So we write down 120. Then 130, 140. And at this point, you can start to see a pattern. We've got uh, 40 and then 20. Uh, so we've got 20, 60, 20, 60, 20, 60, and so forth. And you can just write it out like that. And you know that these are the points in time where the cake or one of the cakes will become visible in cabinet A. Then we just do the same thing for cabinet B, which is a bit simpler because we've just got the one cake now. And so you can see after 10 seconds, that cake will shuffle around to the visible spot. So we'll have 10 seconds. And just count the number from there. So 10 seconds for the cake, then 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, before it's next visible. 
So it's another 70 seconds before it becomes visible again. So just keep adding 70 on to, to make this. So 10 plus 70 is 80, plus 70 is 150, 220, 290, so on. And now again, we're just looking for the number which is common to both, because that will represent the time at which both cabinets are showing a cake. Um, the number that I can see which is visible in both, uh, again, and, and just use the answers to, uh, to help guide you. So 120 is only visible in A, not B. B, 140, only in A, not B. C is 220, and I can see 220 in both A and in B. So after 220 seconds, both A and B will be showing a cake, which is why C is the correct answer. Let's have a look at question three. Um, it's a bit different to the first two in the way it's, it's set up. Um, so I think we'll take a minute to just go through the setup and make sure that we understand it. So in this question, we have a video game where there are two types of characters, hunters and prey. And it says that generally the hunters kill the prey, though occasionally the prey kill the hunters. So we have a game where there are several rounds which come after each other. And obviously over the course of each round, a certain number of hunters and prey uh, are killed. So the number of prey and the number of hunters changes over the course of that round. Now, um, the table below, as it says, shows the number of live hunters and prey at the beginning of each round. So this is an important thing to pick up on. The table here is showing the numbers at the beginning of the round, but not at the end. So just keep that in mind. Uh, and in terms of the two groups, hunters and prey, and how they, how they change in number, we've got two rules here. The first is that at the end of each round, the number of prey that are still alive at that point doubles to make the number that is present at the start of the next round. So in other words, if you have 10 prey at the end of any given round, that number of 10 will double to 20, and there will be 20 prey at the start of the following round. That's a really important thing to pick up on. Um, the rule for the hunters is a bit different. Uh, it just says here that one more hunter gets added at the end of each round. So in terms of this question, in which round was the greatest number of prey killed, um, what, what I would be inclined to do for this question is, again, break it down round by round. In the same way we broke it down before by traffic lights or by cabinets and looked at them individually, I'm going to look at this question round by round and work out how the numbers changed in each of those rounds. So to do that, I'm going to sketch up a table like this. Uh, it may look a bit intimidating, but the top three rows are just the same three as we've got here. So in the real paper, if you wanted to sketch up this, you could just make it underneath the table that's on the page already. So you can see round, hunters, and prey. Uh, and that's the same here, round, hunters, and prey. And importantly, the number is at the start of the round. So this row here is showing prey at the start of the round as described here. Now the additional, uh, additional rows I've put in deal with the number of prey at the end of the round, because remember the number of prey at the end of each round is different from the start of each round, given the numbers that get killed. Uh, and therefore, uh, sorry, and then the final row shows the prey killed during that round. So that'll just be the difference between the two boxes above. So I've got prey at the start, prey at the end, and then therefore the difference, which is the prey who are killed during that round. I haven't bothered with the hunters too much at this point because this question is just dealing with the prey. So we'll, we'll just do this part for now. Um, now in terms of how to work out the number of prey at the end of each round, it's similar to what I mentioned before about how the numbers double between rounds. So the number of alive prey at the end of each round doubles to become the number of prey at the start of the next round. So if we want to know how many prey were present at the end of round one, all we have to do is look at the, at the start of round two and halve that number. So we'll put 15 in there and we can be confident that that's the correct number because that number doubles to become the start of round two. So that's the important thing with this question, that understanding of how we can get this number. And it's just that it comes back to this line here about at the end of each round, the number of prey that are alive doubles. So 15 there because that 15 will double to become 30. And we just go along this row and halve each number to make the number below and to the left. So this one here will be 34 divided by 2, 17. Uh, here, 28 divided by 2, 14. And we'll just keep going in that way to make all the numbers across the row. Now, the one at the bottom, the prey kill during the round, uh, like I said before, it's just the difference between the two numbers above it. So it'll be 8 here, and then 13, 20, and so on. And this, this row here shows us the number of prey killed during each round, which is, if you remember the question, so in which round were the greatest number of prey killed? All we do now is go back to the table and look for the biggest number in this row, which is 20. 
and that occurred in round three. So we can say that the third round is the one where the greatest number of prey were killed. I'm just going to do a couple of additional questions based on the same stem. So everything from the top down to the bottom of this table is the same as the previous question. Uh, but now the question is, in which round was the first hunter killed? So um, the previous question really dealt with prey more than hunters. And so our focus was on just the prey in terms of how the numbers change from the start to the end of each round. For this one, where the focus is very much on the hunters. Um, so we have to work out what's happening with them. Uh, we can see that really the only two mentions of the hunters in the, the stem up here is firstly that occasionally the prey can kill the hunters. Uh, and the other mention is uh, at the end of each round of the game, one more hunter is added. So we can assume that the, the change in the number of hunters from round to round, which you can see here in this row, is just a function of both the numbers being killed, but also the additional one hunter being added uh, at the end of each round to begin the following round. So in other words, between rounds one and two, we can see an increase of hunters from three to four. So what that means is, uh, based on, on what I've just said, at the start of round one, as shown in the table, the number of hunters was three. And we can assume that at the end of the round, at the end of round one, there were still three hunters because at that point, the additional one hunter was added, as mentioned here, to make the four at the start of round two. Likewise, between rounds two and three, the number increases by one. So we can assume that that one is just the additional one being added and therefore no hunters were, no hunters were killed in round two. We can see between rounds three and four, this is the first time where the number doesn't increase, despite there being an, ad an additional hunter added at the end of the round. So we can assume based on that, that this is the first round where one of the hunters was killed, because that, that additional one being added each round has been counteracted by something. We can see that the number doesn't increase overall, so there must have been one hunter lost uh, somewhere in round three, which we can assume is due to, to being killed. So because of this, uh, this lack of increase between rounds three and four, we can say that the third round is the first time that a hunter was killed, and so A is the correct option. Just quickly do question five now too, which kind of combines the first, or sorry, or combines the last two questions. Uh, it's saying, how many more live prey than live hunters were there at the end of the fourth round? So I think um, the traps here that it's easy to, to, again, get confused between the table here, which shows the numbers at the start of each round, and the question itself, which is uh, dealing with the numbers at the end of each round, and particularly the fourth round. So they're obviously different numbers, um, and I think it, it's easiest to go back to our table we did two questions ago, which I'll just do up again. This is just the same one we did in question three, where we've now got, in addition to the normal table, which is the first three rows, we've uh, added two more on the bottom to work out the prey at the end of each round, and the prey uh, killed during the round, which is just the difference of the two numbers above. So going back to our question now, how many more live prey than live hunters were there at the end of the fourth round? So based on that table, we're looking at this column here, round four, we can see that the number of live prey at the end of the round is 15. And the number of live hunters? Well, look at these two numbers. We've got five at the start of round four and six at the start of round five. So that implies that all the hunters in round four survived to the end of the round because we've got that increase of one uh, based on, on this line again, just like the past question. So it implies that in round five, oh, sorry, in round four, all the hunters survived which is why there were five still at the end of the round, and then there was that additional one added, uh, which is why it goes up to six in the next round. So basically, at the end of round four, we've got just the five hunters still, and we know from here we've got the 15 prey, and so the difference in number is 10, which is why the answer here would be B. New question now. Uh, we can see now we've got a card game where there are four players, and there are a total of 10 cards in circulation, numbered from one through to 10. And the, the basic rules of this game are that, um, that uh, the, the aim of the game is to get rid of all your cards. And in each round, when someone manages to do that, that's the end of the round. And that person who, who won and who managed to get rid of all their cards scores zero. And the remaining players have to add up the numbers on the cards they're still holding to make up their score for that round. So it's a game where the lowest score is best. Um, you can see in this game there are, there are four players, Ali, Brendan, Colin, and Damien. And this table here on the right shows their round-by-round round cumulative scores. 
So you can see each column represents a different player. And as we go down each column, uh, you can see their scores adding up round by round. So it's cumulative, which is why the numbers just get bigger and bigger. So for example, in round five, say, which would be this row, these numbers here aren't the scores that they scored just in round five. It's the total for everything up until and including round five. So the question here is who won the most rounds and how many times did they win? Um, I've seen a lot of people stumble on this because they kind of go down uh, the columns and just count up the number of times the same number pops up. So for example, they might go down Colin's row and say, well, there's four 70s there. So therefore Colin won four times. Um, as we'll see in a minute, that's not the, the correct way to do it and it, it will lead to mistakes. So what I would do, again, it's similar to the previous previous questions, just go through and break it down round by round and work out what happened round by round. Uh, very similar to the, the hunter and prey question before. So you can see in round one, Brendan would be the winner because he's the one who scored zero. And that's as per this line in here about uh, the player scoring zero who wins. Uh, that means that, that Brendan won the first round. In the second round, we're now looking for the player whose score didn't change between the first and second round. So you can see that in the second round, Damien won because he didn't score any more points. So he would have won that round. Uh, same for the third, no change in number. And we just go through round by round and, and do this. So you can see in the fourth round, it was Ali and, and so on. So you can see here that, um, as I mentioned before, Colin only won three rounds, not four, because you don't count the first time the number appears. It's only when that same number appears for a second time in a particular column that represents that they won. So we'll keep going down like this. Okay, and you can see you've just got very nicely the winner for each round. No room for mistakes if you do it this way. Uh, and it's just a case of counting up who won the most. So it looks like Damien to me. And we can see here, uh, one, two, three, four. So Damien has won, and he's won four rounds. So B would be the answer there. I'm gonna do a follow-up question to the previous one now. So it's the same stem, um, but we're now being told that there was one error in the scoring as shown here in the table at the right. Uh, and our, the question posed to us is, which round of the game did this error occur? So I guess the, the big challenge of this question, and it is a pretty tough question, is to work out what a potential error could be. So in other words, in this particular game, what, what errors in scoring could be made? Uh, and then subsequently, how would that be shown in, in the table? How would you pick up on that based on just this massive numbers in the table? Um, so, I mean, we'll, we'll go through, through that in a minute. I think the easiest way to do this is to work out each player's score round by round. Because um, at the moment, we've just got the cumulative scores. But if we're looking for, or if we're looking to pick up on just a single mistake in a single round, um, it's easy to have the scores for each round rather than the cumulative scores. So you can imagine that'd be a pretty tough and, and time-consuming process if you wanted to go through for every round and every player and work out the scores for each player in each round. Uh, that's, you know, 40 different calculations you'd have to make based on on the four players in the 10, 10 rounds. Um, so I think you have to be, be smart with this and, and just target what, what you need to know. So look at the answers. We've got that the error is either going to occur in the second, fifth, seventh or eighth rounds. And so if I'm going to work out the, uh, the player's individual scores for each round, I'm going to just stick to those four and forget the other six. Uh, so begin with the second round and it's just a case of, of subtracting the scores from the previous round so in other words we know with Ali that in the first round she scored 7 and in the, after the second round her total score was 41 so that means that her score just for round 2 was 34 because it's the difference between those two numbers and we just go through and we work out the scores for the rest of the, the players in round 2 uh, sorry that should be 15 so we'll, um, we'll just do that for just the four rows, uh, which uh, represent the four different rounds that an error could have occurred in based on the answers, because that way you're only doing it for four rows rather than four for 10. So we'll go 15, uh, six, and zero. Uh, the next round where an error could have occurred is the fifth. So we'll go down to fifth, uh, six, 82, 
while I'm doing this, have a think about what um, what an error could be in this particular game. So, for example, um, one possible error is that you could have a round where no one scored zero, because remember the winner, the single winner, is the one who scores zero, and everyone else has to add up the numbers on their cards. So if you have a, if you find a round where uh, either no one scores zero or more than one person scores zero, that would be an error, uh, and that would be a way to find the answer. So we'll keep an eye out for that, but there are a few other things that it could be. Okay, so there we go. These are the, the four rounds where we've got potential errors, and I've just written out the scores for each player just in that round, so we can have a better idea of, of picking up on an, a potential error. So. Um, the thing I just mentioned about uh, one person scoring zero in each round is pretty consistent with what I've got here. You can see just the one zero in each of the four rounds. So unfortunately, it's not that. That means you have to keep brainstorming and thinking of other ways that an error could present. Um, look through. I mean, look through the rules of the game and just imagine what would happen if you subverted those rules or if those rules were, were broken. Um, one of the main rules here is that. Uh, at any given time, all 10 cards are being held by the players. And presumably, at the point someone wins by getting rid of their cards, therefore all 10 cards are being held by the remaining people. So those 10 cards should add up to the same number. And if we add up uh, 1 through to 10, you end up with 55. So there should be, uh, so each of these rounds should add up to 55. The only exception being uh, this final line of if a player has 8 or more cards, their score for the round doubles. So each round should add up to 55, unless one player has eight or more cards, in which case that number could be much bigger. So we'll go through and add up the rows quickly. We can see here this is 55. Uh, the next row down is much bigger. This is uh, 96. Uh, keep going down. This one here is 14, 12, 18. So this is uh, 44. Uh, and the bottom one here is 9, 18, uh, 37 that is, sorry, so that's 55. Okay, so this is looking pretty promising. We've got two rows where the combined scores of everyone add up to 55, which is what we're expecting because that's 1 plus 2 plus 3, 3 to 10, which should be just the sum of all the remaining cards in the game. This one here, uh, round 5, this is a very big number. But what we're thinking is probably that uh, 82 is just the number... Oh, sorry, we're, we're thinking in this round, round 5, that Brendan had 8 or more cards, and therefore his number doubled. So if we halve 82 to give 41, 41 plus 8 plus 6 adds up to 55. So that, that also makes sense. If we imagine this round, in this round, that uh, Ali was just holding the 6 card, and Damien was holding the 8, and Brendan was holding the rest which is eight cards in total, his score would then double from 41 to 82, and this round would make sense as well. But this round here, where it adds up to 44, there's no real explanation for, because if all 10 cards are in circulation, they should add up to at least 55, if not more, if someone's holding eight or more cards. So for that reason, we can say that in this round, there is some error in the scoring. We can't be sure quite where it is, but the numbers that are there just don't quite add up. And so for that reason, the answer would be C, 7. There's three more questions in this video and they're all based on the same stem, the same story up here. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. I just want to say first that it's, it's a very difficult set of three questions. It's about as hard as it can get in UMAP. So don't feel discouraged if you still feel a bit uncertain at the end of this. It's, um, it, it really is the, the top in terms of difficulty. What I want you to take from these questions and the video as a whole is that all the questions I've looked at today in the video have been similar in style, and that style is that they involve changes over time. And the approach that we've used for every question so far, and will use in this video, is just to break things down, either by variable or by time. So the first few questions we broke it down by variable, you think back to the, the various traffic lights and we looked at them one by one, or the, the carousel with the food. Um, you know, we, we, we broke those down one by one in terms of the variables. Um, in the later questions about the video game and uh, more recently the, the card game, uh, we looked at round-by-round -round scoring or round-by-round -round numbers. 
and, uh, and just broke it down and worked out what's happening in every single round. These next three questions are similar to that. We're looking, gonna look at round by round or uh, time period by time period. But um, the important thing to take out of the whole video is just when you get a question like this in the real thing, even though it may be overwhelming, don't panic and don't kind of just go to, go to mush. Identify that it's one of these questions, it's this style, and think how can I break it down round by round or variable by variable. Once you've got some kind of plan like that, you're halfway there. So with this one, which I've already mentioned is very difficult, um, let's, let's try and go through it. Uh, take a minute to, to really read the question or, or read the stimulus uh, and the information given to you very carefully, because it's good to be able to picture it in your head as much as possible before you start doing the actual working. So we've got a chair factory with four departments, A, B, C, and D. And the important thing is we can see that each chair progresses through the, the departments in that order. So in other words, each chair goes from A to B to C to D. And once it's finished in D, then it's complete. It's a, it's a finalized chair. Now, each, each department is staffed by a different number of people in each half hour period of the day, as is shown in the table below. So this line is probably the most important of all because what it's saying is this table here on the right is showing the number of staff in each department at each hour period of the day. A lot of people, when they try this question, just assume that this shows the number of chairs, but it's got nothing to do with that. It's just showing the number of staff in each department. Um, the other important thing is each person can complete their part of one chair in an hour. So the example given is if there are four people in department D at 12 p.m., which we can see that there are, then the armrest for four chairs can be made in that hour, but no more. So four people equals four parts of their chair processed, whatever that part is. Okay, the, the final bit is giving, is giving you is the number of chairs at the start of the day. So at the start of the day, there are three, six, five, and four chairs in A, B, C, and D respectively. That's the raw material they have to work with at the start of the day. And it says in each subsequent hour, department A work, uh, begins work on as many new chairs as their capacity allows. So they just bring in as much new raw material as they can process based on the number of people in department A in that hour. So it's a lot to take in, but um, just take a minute to go through all that and make sure you understand the premise of the question or, or of the information rather. Now, when it comes to the question, it's how many fully completed chairs we, will be produced by the end of this day, assuming the day finishes at 6 p.m. So what I'm gonna do is very similar to before. We're gonna go hour by hour and work out in each of those hours how the chairs move between departments and how many get completed. And once I've done that, we can add up at the end all the chairs made in each of the one hour periods to get our, our final total number for the day. So how do we do that? Um, well, basically I'm gonna draw up a table like this. Now, don't panic too much. This is just the same table as we've got here but I put in an extra row in between every other row. So you can see there's now an empty row, but the numbers are all the same. In the real paper, you could probably just sketch it down on the page itself. So you wouldn't have to sketch up a massive table. You could just do it on the one they've given you. So what we've got here are the time periods. And remember the black numbers here are referring to the number of staff in each department in each hour period, because that's what we've got in the table here based on what they've told us in the information. So the black numbers are dealing with the number of staff. I'm going to put some red numbers in the table now, and they represent the number of chairs in the department at each stage. So we've got initially that there are three, six, five, and four that was given to us here at the bottom. So this is the raw materials that each department have to work with in this one hour period. So I, I would begin with D because D is the department, which is the one that finalizes the chair and work out for this one hour period, eight to 9 a.m., how many chairs will they complete? Well, keeping in mind that um, one person can make one chair in one hour, as it says in the, the previous slide, if they have three people in department D in this hour and they have the raw material to make or to complete four chairs, um, they'll make a total of three chairs. Because remember the, the limiting step is the number of people in this particular case. They could make four, but they don't have enough people. They've only got enough people to make three chairs. So in this first hour, they'll make three chairs, which I'll pop there. So at the end of this hour period, they will have made three chairs. Now we have to work out how these numbers change for the next hour period. So this is the tricky part. 
so imagine department D again. Now they've got five staff for the next hour. And we want to know how much raw material they have. So they've, they've made three chairs. Three chairs are gone. But from the previous hour, they've still got the one chair remaining. So I'm going to write this up now. So in this box in department D, they've got the raw material for one chair from the previous hour that they didn't make, plus they'll have whatever they get from department C. So in other words, whatever department C completed in the previous hour will get passed down to department D to be completed. So look back at department C in the previous hour. They had three staff and five chairs to make. So they would have made three chairs in total. And so those three chairs would have gone then from department C to department D, and so we'll have three chairs there. What that means is this number here should be four, as we've got here. Now, we then have to work out how the rest of the department, or, or what number of chairs are present in the rest of the department. So I'll take this away for a second, and we'll, we'll do that. So in department C, uh, based on the previous hour, they will have two chairs that they haven't yet processed remaining, so two left over, plus, whatever they get from department B. So look at department B, they had two staff before uh, and they had six chairs. So they would have made two chairs. So two chairs would go from B to C. So again, it's two plus two. Department B, well, they had six chairs to make, they only made two, so there'll be four left over. And then we add that to uh, whatever they got from department A. You can see department A had four people, but only three chairs to make. So in this case, the limiting step is the number of chairs they had to work on, which is just the three. And so they would have made all three and sent it down to department B. So those three would have been down, sent down to department B the next hour, which is why it's four plus the three. Uh, and finally, this, this final step. So at the end of the previous hour, department A would have had no more chairs. But uh, on the previous slide, it said that at the beginning of each new hour, department A begin work on as many new chairs as their capacity allows. So that just means that if there are five people now, they'll start work on five chairs. So that's why we get the numbers we had before of five, seven, four, four. And we keep going from there. So we know that now in this one hour period in department D, we have uh, the raw material to make four chairs, but only f uh, but five people to work on them. So we'll make all four of those chairs, which is why we put the four there. Because we say, we're saying now that four chairs were made in this one hour period. That's the process we go through. Um, you can just do it for the remaining rows if you want. I'll pop the answers in there. You can see it's quite a long process, but hopefully you'd have a good three or four questions based on this. And you can see how things progress row by row. Now, with that done, if we go back to the question, uh, how many fully completed chairs will be produced by the end of this day? Well, it's just a case now of adding up our total column because remember, this is showing the number of chairs made or completed uh, in every hour period. So we're just adding up three plus four plus two, so on. And we get to the answer of 24. So C is correct. Now, the final two questions are much kinder, uh, but mainly because we've done all the hard work in terms of the working out of the table. So look at this question. It's um, how many incomplete chairs will there be by the end of the day? So. Let's go back to our working. You can see now that we've got everything completed row by row, hour by hour, it's very easy to pick out any information you want from any part of the day. So we're looking at the end of the day, which is the 5 to 6 p.m. shift. And the question is, how many incomplete chairs will there be? So um, it's, it's pretty simple. All you have to do is just add up the numbers in this row minus the one at the end, or, or sorry, with, without the one at the end. So the reason being, this is showing the 5 to 6 p.m. period. Um, at the end of that, department D, which is the final department a chair goes through, will have completed both of those two chairs that they have the raw material to make, which is shown down here. So at the end of the day, these two chairs are shown here will be complete, but everything else in this row will be uh, incomplete. So it's just a case of adding up those three numbers. So 20, 17, and four, the answer is 41. Uh, the trap here is really just to add, is that uh, if you add up that extra two at the bottom or in department D, then you get to answer C, which is 43. Uh, but you can see how quickly you can get to answers once you've done the initial working 
assuming there are a few questions based on the initial stimulus. Okay, question 10. Final question. Again, it's fairly straightforward. The, um, the question here is saying, if the working day went for an hour longer until 7pm and there were eight people working in Department D, how many completed chairs would there then be by the end of the day? So you can sketch up additional rows if you want, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, we're just imagining now that there are eight people in this box. I'll actually write it in. Um, I'll change it to black too, just because it, in this table the black numbers represent the, the staff. Um, so we'll put eight there. We're now saying that this is uh, 6 to 7 p.m. And there are eight people in Department D. So think about what, what they'll have left over. So in the previous hour, Department D completed both of the two chairs they had to work on. So there'll be no backlog at the start of the next hour period, which is the one we're interested in. But how much will they get from Department C? Well, you can see in the previous hour, Department C had 20 chairs to work on, but only 12 workers. So they would have completed 12 chairs. So that means in this hour period, the additional hour we're looking at now, uh, they'll have eight staff and 12 chairs to work on. But obviously the limiting step there is the number of people, which is eight. And so therefore we'll end up with another, I'll just write down there, another plus eight chairs completed by the end of the day. So all you have to do is go back to the previous answer of, of uh, how many chairs they were completed by 6 p.m. and add another eight onto that. So that was uh, 24 chairs completed by the end of 6 p.m. So if we add on eight more, the answer is 32. Again, you can see how quick you can come to an answer once you've done the initial working. So if you can see a few answers based on, uh, on one stimulus or, or one stem, take the time to really be careful working it out and to, to work it out properly because it's, a, it's an investment. That's it for this video. Um, as I said before, just the thing to take away is even though these questions are quite different in some ways, they do have that fundamental property of showing changes over time. And the way to, to break it down is just look at each variable or each time period one by one uh, and just work out what's happening step by step. So that's the, the take home message here. Hope it helped.